Good evening. This is ENCA Moneyline, your money guide. My name is Sikim Gabadeli. Coming up on the show tonight. Vodacom's numbers drop the phone as company earnings take the hot seat in trade today. The price of homes in townships rises slightly more than the price of homes in suburbs. And we get advice on how you can enter the investing market without breaking the bank. All this and more coming up tonight, but first, your top stories. Well, Vodacom signed up 7.2 million new customers in the six months to September, but due to lower mobile termination rates, the company has lost almost a billion rand. The operator now says things could get even worse if it doesn't invest more money. Vodacom says the mobile market will remain a tough one to operate in. The company has reported a 5.7% decline in profits for its 2015 financial year. South Africa's second largest listed telecoms company was hit hard by a cut in mobile termination rates. The Independent Communications Authority has slashed the price of calls charged between networks by 50%. Vodacom says this will continue to be a major challenge in the coming years with more cuts anticipated. With its South Africa market only growing revenue by 0.1%, the CEO is confident that further investment will amount to more growth. That's the big thing in telecoms. It's a capital intensive business. And I think, um, honestly, one of the reasons that I think we're outpacing our competition in South Africa and in every market that we operate is because we're willing to invest. Um, I think success follows capital investment as well. Having spent 5.8 billion rand so far on upgrading and expanding its mobile coverage, Vodacom says it will continue to make good progress if it continues to cater to particular segments and making it affordable for all. At the same time, Vodacom is awaiting the Competition Commission's approval for the purchase of fixed-line operator Neotel. Is, is obviously keep Neotel as a standalone, but tuck our fixed business under it and use that then as a vehicle to grow. And I think what Neotel gives us is it gives us capability. So there's just under a thousand people. Um, and if we add the two teams together, we'll have a lot more capability. And properly capitalized, I think, you know, it could be, it could be a good challenger to telecom. But more importantly, it can help the country get towards the, the ambitious broadband plans that we've set for ourselves. Well, for a look at the impact of mobile termination rates on the mobile service providers, I'm joined in studio now by Farai Mafinia from J.M. Busher Asset Managers. Farai, thanks so much for your time uh, this evening. 50% drop um, in mobile termination rates really did a number um, on Vodacom, as you saw with their interconnect uh, revenue coming down. What, did you expect that kind of a drop? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of the players in the market did expect uh, the, uh, the mobile termination rate to come down. If you look at their blended um, uh, pricing point, it was actually down only about 18%, despite a 50% uh, cut in mobile termination rate. Um, I think if we dwell too much on the termination rates, we actually sort of uh, forget to just how, how difficult the environment they are operating in. I think there are more macro headwinds which they are facing. And you, I think we also saw the numbers in the retail sales. So to dwell much on the mobile termination rates is probably not um, looking at the actual numbers. If you actually break it down, uh, if we had excluded the impact of mobile termination rates, um, they would have only uh, grown their revenue by 2.9%. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at that, for us in real terms, it's actually a decline of 3.1%. So despite uh, the big impact on the mobile termination rates, I don't think the market would have taken kindly to the numbers that they reported. Absolutely. Here. So let's let's talk about some of those macro yes. um, headwinds. I mean, we've got consumers who are under increasing pressure. Yes. Um, will you listen to um, the CEO, Shamil Jusup, and he's saying basically that, look, uh, at the end of the day, we've got more people going into prepaid because the contracts are falling off. Yes. So they dealing, they are reflecting what's happening in the economy? That's correct. Um, I, I think the key issue there is while m mobile termination rates had an impact, uh, the consumer is under a lot of pressure and for them there are only probably four or five key points which uh, the companies can act on to, to alleviate all that. So the first one is actually on the pricing point. Mm -hmm. um, I think they are seeing a whole lot of uh, competition from the likes of Celsi and to an extent uh, Telco Mobile. And then secondly also it's on the network quality. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very key. So they can fight hard on the pricing side. But if they take too many customers on their network, it will actually uh, yeah, impact the quality of their network. Yeah. And then thirdly is their distribution. Uh, th 
while well, well, they can say they've got good uh, prepaid packages and the like, if they can roll it out to the people, then it won't be very good. And then the last point, which I think is also key, is on the service level. Um, yeah. So if they drop the ball on that, so we saw what happened on Friday with uh, Celsius getting a big slap um, with the disgruntled, uh, disgruntled customer, customer mm -hmm. putting a huge banner uh, just showing that their service level is actually key. So I think those four are the key um, uh, sort of levers which they can play with. And it's a balancing act because at the end of the day, they have to manage the costs across all those uh, four, yeah. four, 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 four factors. As, as expected, they're seeing growth in, in data usage. South Africans are starting to pick this up. They introduce um, a low-cost a low smartphone um, and tablet as well. I just wonder, is that going to make up for it, though? Is it going to make up the margins because the pr even though the prices have come down, um, the, the, you know, even though they, they're increasing the number of people who are using data, the prices are coming down. Yeah. Um, I actually don't think they'll be able to offset the decline in voice. So that yeah. decline in voice is actually one of those medium to, to long-term headwinds which we think affects this business more than MTR, which is probably a three-year uh, time horizon. Uh, if you look at the margins uh, for data, they're definitely lower. But obviously for them, uh, they, they sort of pushing that side of the business to offset uh, the, 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 the loss that they're making on the, on the voice side. Mm -hmm. I think it was MTN which came up with, uh, with a comment. I think it was Ahmed Farouk who said, uh, within a few years, uh, voice will be free. And I don't think it's far off from the truth, so. <laughs> we can't wait for that day. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Absolutely yes. not. Yeah. Comparing the two, um, if you look at um, MTN and Vodacom, and you look at how their share prices have performed, yes. MTN has been outpacing um, a Vodacom. Yes. Why is that? Um, I think it's definitely just a, mi a mixture of the portfolio of assets that they've got. If you look at MTN, Apart from South Africa, where they are second to Vodacom, in most of the regions that they operate, they are actually one of the dominant players. And I think that's the challenge that Vodacom faces, to say on the local markets, they've got the MTR headwinds, uh, they've got all these uh, regulation uh, which is affecting their business. Yeah. And then outside of South Africa, they're actually not the dominant player in the regions that they play. If you look at Tanzania, they compete with, um, with uh, Millicom and, and, yeah. and, uh, and Airtel. If you look at the DRC, they are not the dominant player there. In Mozambique, they are second to Amcel. They are obviously the largest one in Lesotho, but it won't make a, a material difference. So I think if you look at the growth, uh, MTN came in with their third quarter numbers. Yeah. And the Africa, rest of African operations, which is now called the large OPCO, they grew their top line by 15.6%. If you look at Vodacom, they grew their top line call it 13% because yeah. of Forex translation, but in constant currency, it was only up 5.6%. Uh, mm, so that's huge. Mm. So uh, it's, it's barely beating inflation on a weighted average basis in the regions that they operate. So I think the market is saying, where are they actually going to get that kicker that can move the needle for the, for the business? We'll be watching. Thanks so much for your time today. Farai Mafinya is with a JM Busher Asset Managers. Now, Lonman lost over 3.4 billion rand in the 2014 financial year, mainly due to the five-month platinum strike in the first half of the year. The company reported a 2.8 billion rand loss, dropping from a profit of over 1.6 billion rand last year. Lonman CEO Ben Magara says the miner is looking at saving more than 2 billion rand over the next three years. The plan is to boost productivity and reduce costs. The company returned its mines to production within two months of the end of the strike, the Lonman share price ended the day over 7% stronger at 34.99 a share. The growth in house prices in former black townships marginally outperformed homes in former white suburbs in the third quarter of 2014. The demand for housing in the townships as classified under apartheid reflected a good balance with supply. But according to FNB, with supply only slightly behind demand prices, are only slight, slightly behind demand, prices aren't likely to skyrocket. House price growth in former black townships grew 9.5% from the third quarter of 2013, the average price of a home either bought or sold in the township areas averaged just over 300,000 rand. But this figure is almost four times lower than the average home, va home value transacted in the major metro areas. The International Monetary Fund has released a report on Zimbabwe's economic status. It says the country isn't showing any signs of recovery. Despite government efforts, the majority of Zimbabweans continue to live in poverty, struggling to make ends meet. Every day, Darlington Tikweserere tends his small vegetable garden on the outskirts of Zimbabwe's capital, Harare. Like millions in the country, high unemployment and lack of economic growth 
have driven him into small-scale trading on his vegetable produce. It's tough. Companies are shutting down instead of opening so that we can get jobs. Life has become difficult and I just don't know how this country is being run. Zimbabwe's economy has been in a tailspin for over a decade. It showed signs of revival after dropping its own currency and adopting the dollar around 2008. But it's since stagnated. Previously, one person in every seven in Zimbabwe had a job. Today, one person in every 15 has a job. So that's one fifteenth that are coping well enough with employment, but 14 out of 15 are struggling with something else. The International Monetary Fund says controversial foreign ownership laws enacted by President Robert Mugabe in 2007 spooked international investors. The 90-year-old leader insists the laws empower formerly disadvantaged black Zimbabweans. But critics say the very laws are a key factor in crippling the country's once vibrant economy. Furniture retailer Ellerines has received a potential offer for its sub-Saharan Africa business. The 400 million rand offer comes as the business looks to wind down in the hopes of repaying creditors who'd already voted to liquidate the entity. The failed furniture arm of African Bank was placed under business rescue in August. The move came after African Bank Investments cut off its funding as it was also being rescued by the central bank. Ellerines has close to 80 stores in South Africa and the region. The company is in advanced talks to sell two of its brands to other furniture retailers, but fears remain over the security of jobs for its staff members. Ellerines owes its creditors close to 1.3 billion rand. French car maker Renault has opened its first plant in Algeria. The plant co cost almost 700 million rand and is set to boost the car maker's presence in Africa's second biggest automaker, uh, auto market. With an initial production target of 25,000 cars a year, Renault hopes to triple this figure. Nearly half of the company's sales are from outside Europe. Algeria is Renault's 10th largest market, commanding a 25.5% share of Algeria's car market. Around 425,000 vehicles were sold in the country in 2013, making it the continent's second largest automotive market behind South Africa. Renault says its growth potential in the country is great. That's because seven out of every 10 cars on the country's roads are over 10 years old. And when Moneyline returns, ever wondered how you could get really get into the world of investing? Well, we answer all those questions and more after this. This is ENCA Moneyline, your money guide. Stay with us.